I'm Loïc Dachary, I'm a Ceph developer. Ceph is a 10-year-old project uh, that I heard about for the first time three years ago. It was created by the cool guy in California to the right, Sage, and an octopus to the left, hence the name Ceph, which means cephalopod, and there is a whole uh, thing about that. I'm going to focus on how you can save space with Ceph. So the idea with Ceph is one powerful idea. In addition to being a distributed self-healing virtual storage, is that you can ask it to keep your data, and if something is lost somewhere, you will get it back. So how can we do that and save space? Mm -hmm. Instead of explaining what Azure code is in theory, uh, I will need four volunteers to just explain how uh, it works mathematically. Four volunteers? If you could stand up. Yeah, or I will designate someone. Okay, you, please. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. You, 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 you just need to be a bit. Can you? No? Okay, please. Can you stand up? Two, one more. Yeah. You. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, in Ceph, uh, we have disks, which we know as OSDs, but you, you can think of them as virtual disks. So here, this let's say you are two bits in a disk in an OSD. You are two bits in another OSD. The idea with Ceph is that when you write somewhere, you write to the primary. So let's say you're the primary, and I'm the user, and I want to write something. So I will give that to you, and you are bit number one, and you are bit number zero. Okay, data chunk two, data chunk one, you are one, you are zero. So when you're available, I can read you but your role as a bit is all of a sudden you may become unavailable. So you flip the card. Like, oh yeah, we, we can't read you anymore. So <laughs> I, as a user, I write to you and the first thing you do is by default in Ceph, you replicate yourself to the other OSD. So you give one bit to, that's the role of the primary. So the user writes to the primary, the primary rise to the secondary. So there, I'm a happy user. I will try to use to read the data. But if all of a sudden you become unreadable, flip, then I can go to the secondary, which is fine. It's replication. It's not rocket science, but it's really expensive. Sorry, you're too expensive. We're going to <laughs> do the same thing with just three guys. So you can go back to your place <laughs> and Let's do that with just three guys. How can we do that? We will use mathematics and really what you know as red five is that, an XOR table. So we have three OSDs now. You are here, you are OSD two, you are here, another OSD. So we have three disks instead of two to play this trick. And you will still be the primary. And what I will do, so, uh, but you know math, you know that. So you keep that somewhere, that's your mathematical knowledge. And me as a user, I come to you with these two bits and I give them to you. And instead of replicating the data stupidly to the other USD, you do some math. So you have one and zero which gives us one and zero, that gives us one, I think. So if you yeah. play the, one. yeah, this cute thing, it says one, oh, magic. And so now you have three, three parts, but if you keep them all, we lose the point of being able to lose an OSD and not lose data. So you give one bit whatever. to whatever. Ah, that's the magic trick. See, like, like you shuffle cards and then say, ah, whatever, it will work. Okay, 
And now, all of a sudden, something breaks. So let's say you're not readable. Can we reconstruct you? One and one gives zero. Is it what you have? Wow, that's good. <laughs> if we lose you, uh, zero and one, zero and one, one, is it one? Yes. So we achieve the same, essentially, the same as the replication, only we have three guys instead of four. That's red five, and thank you, gentlemen, for your performance. It was excellent. And so this simplistic approach uh, is generalized to some extent with red six that allows you to do the same, but you can lose two. And in Ceph, and that's why it's called erasure coded storage instead of red five or red six, we can even go as far as 200, uh, being able to lose 200 disks, why not? And you have, you split your data in 1,000 pieces. Of course, we don't do that because, well, that, that would be weird. But most of the people trying to use a Azure code commonly split the data in 10 parts and create four more parts, parity parts, that allows them to lose four disks without losing data. And with a Azure code elevated from XOR, to some mathematical concept that I do not comprehend at all, which is Galois field and whatnot, then you are able to have the same effect as uh, five replica, but you only have a fraction of the cost. What happened over there? <laughs> there is a lot. What was it? No? <laughs> okay. It's okay. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Sorry, it's communicative. I, I see you laugh your ass out, and it's, it's getting to me. Okay, so uh, you go from having uh, three petabytes to be able to lose uh, two disks uh, at the same time to 1.3 petabytes. Uh, when you are a cloud provider, that's quite a win, but it comes at a price. It's not magical. First, uh, it's harder to do object mutations. So in Ceph, actually, if, uh, as Open Nebula does, you use mostly RBD to provide disks to virtual machines, you cannot uh, use an erasure coded pool to do that because some operations are missing. For instance, you cannot do a partial write so imagine you have four, uh, four megabytes, you write one byte in the middle, you have to recompute everything. Well, it's possible and could be optimized, but it's not done yet. In addition, it has a performance cost. So you, uh, you cannot really uh, expect uh, performances to be the same with the Azure code because you have to compute a lot of things. Then, uh, recovery is also more complicated because when you have a copy, as we saw during the game, whenever the user tries to read the copy, it goes to the primary, it does not work, it goes to the secondary, the whole object is there. There is, it's easy. But to recompute the data when one OSD misses with uh, original coded pools, then you have to recompute the missing part, which takes CPU and bandwidth to get all the parts, et cetera. To mitigate that, in Ceph, there is cache tiering. So you, if you can't uh, use the erasure coded pool directly, then you can put a cache tier in front of it. So for instance, if you have a very large RBD volumes that are not very hot, so you're not very concerned by the performances, you can say, okay, I will create a replicated pool and my application will write to it and behind the scene, Ceph will transparently for you move the bytes that are called, let's say after a week, to the original coded pool. 
So it takes less space and it's less flexible, but you have both of the same, uh, you have the best of the both, world, both worlds. Ah. And when you try to read transparently again, uh, it goes from the erasure coded pool to the replicated pool and your application does not see a thing except a lag in performance, of course. You have lat more latency. It was first released in uh, May 2014, uh, which is, well, one year and a half ago. And it still needs a lot of performance improvements, et cetera. Do you need to be concerned by the fact that it's not ready for you right now? Not really, because let's say that you plan this increase in capacity. So you have three petabytes provisioned and that much used. And then it grows and in February you, you think you will be at this stage. Then you can say, okay, at some point I will use erasure coded pools to reduce the, my space consumption. Because with cache tiering, I will be able to do that transparently. I do not need to do it from the beginning when I don't actually need it. So here you don't need it, you have plenty of space. So you live happily uh, and you wait for things to get better in terms of performance and whatnot. So you put erasure coded pools when you need them. You do not need to save space before shortage. Um, I will skip unless there is big interest, what I had to say about reliability models, that is when your da data is in danger, uh, it changes a bit with Azure Coded Pool compared to replication. You, you're interested? Yes. Okay. Um, so it's, it's a topic that took me a long time to not figure out because I, I don't understand it. Uh, I don't understand how you can uh, assert uh, the reliability of what you have. And the mathematics and the concepts involved are beyond the capacity of an engineer. Uh, it's more something of a mathematician. So I, I decided uh, to use a trick and say, okay, I, I can't think about that globally. I will just reason based on what is normal for me. So I built a cluster. It's all doing fine. Now I want to think about what happens when I lose one disk. This is, this is where uh, my reliability model actually matters. From the point of view of Ceph, uh, and it's what it's supposed to do, uh, it ought right away, when you lose a disk, it notices it, it starts to replicate uh, things everywhere. Or in the case of erasure coded pool, it starts to again compute uh, parity chunks and move them around. This is the rec recovery time. And this is the time where you have less redundancy than usual. And you want to make that time as short as possible. So if uh, some people here have pre-hammer uh, self installations, uh, there is an important uh, misconception. Whenever you plug a new disk, Ceph will claim that you have degraded objects, which is not true. It's misplaced objects. So it's not because you plug the new disk, all of a sudden uh, a lot of objects start to disappear. No, but because you have more capacity, Ceph will gradually move objects to use that capacity and level uh, all the disks so that they are at the same percentage of usage. So during this time, this uh, misplaced configuration backfilling of Ceph for a new disk, this time does not matter at all. It can take 48 hours, you don't care, because you are not in danger of losing anything more than you were before. It's completely different when you're in recovery. That is, you remove a disk permanently and it starts to recover. Then that you want 
to recover as quickly as possible. I don't have, uh, again, I use a trick <coughs> to configure Ceph so that uh, it does that as fast as possible. When you have a small cluster, and by small cluster, I mean uh, less than 50 OSDs, more or less. Uh, for, for most people, it means about 10 machines, something like that. Then you can be pretty sure that all your machines are going to be involved whenever you remove a one terabyte disk. So you want all your machines on, on, a, on a switch, and you know they will all be working toward recovery, and there is not really something you can do to improve that, except making sure that you have good bandwidth, etc. I mean, in terms of uh, architecture, I, I don't see what you can do. By contrast, when you grow your cluster to 100 nodes, 500 nodes, 1,000 nodes, then you start to leverage what Ceph does best, that is creating locality in recovery. What you want to do is balance uh, these difficult things, which are placement groups, so that when you think about what happens when you remove a disk, it maximizes the bandwidth available between nodes and does not use all the nodes because that would be a complete waste. So you don't want to impact the performance of all the nodes. You want recovery to happen at maximum capacity of your network and your machines while involving as few machines as possible. And there you see when balancing the placement groups to achieve that, that is to re reduce the recovery time, the number of chunks involved in the recovery, the number of copies matter a great deal. If you have uh, erasure code with 10 plus four, it means that by default, whenever you lose one chunk, you need 13 chunks from 13 OSDs to come back and recompute this one chunk that will then be rewritten. Only this one, though, but by contrast to copying things when one disk fails, it's completely different. The bandwidth used is different, etc. There is no uh, way to do that mathematically, uh, not that I know, but it's not too difficult to think about. There is a page that explains how to reason about that and although uh, it takes a few hours, it's not a matter of days. So that's what I wanted to say about reliability model and erasure coding. It's not extremely specific. I think I'm out of time. We can, we can go to the questions or you can finish the presentation. Okay. Um, okay, uh, there is one thing that uh, so the, uh, then I, I wanted to talk shortly about the new, uh, new things about Azure code. And since we talked about reliability model, this matters uh, a little bit. Uh, if what you want is to have two data centers and you want to have uh, Azure coded pool uh, across them, then you have this problem that I just mentioned. If you lose one chunk, in one data center, then you will need to get the chunks from the two data centers in order to reconstruct it, uh, which is kind of space travel when it comes to communicating between data centers because it's so slow, it's so long. So you can use a plugin uh, that allows you to define locally, local uh, chunks. So the trick is really simple. Uh, when you have uh, chunks here, one to seven, eight to 14, in each data center, you calculate another one, which purpose is to recover just one chunk if it's lost in this data center. That is, you layer one more Azure code that is red five, basically, uh, in each data center, so that in the most common case where you lose just one disk in one data center, you do not need everything. 
If you lose two disks here, then oh, okay, you take everything. But 99% of the uh, failures, just one disk, you can repair locally. And um, stop me if you see something that is of interest. Otherwise, we will go to questions. Oh, well, this is complicated. You will know. Well, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, any questions? Yep. Is there any quick question before we move on to the... Or maybe we can move to the next session and then wait for all the questions during the open discussion. Okay. If that's okay with all of you. Okay, thank you.